by turning my video on. Yes, uh, so good, good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is for you. Uh, I will be talking on the feasibility of measure and extinction of single particles. And well, the topic is trivial at first glance. So basically you have energy conservation if some incident power is getting on the particle and some is transmitted. So the difference should be due to absorption and scattering. And this is commonly called extinction. So this simple concept works very fine when you try um, to measure it for a collection of particles. So you just put a detector here, uh, one moment. Uh, so put a detector here with particles and without particles, if you can get the difference, you get the total extinction by this collection. And it works fine due to relative displacement of the particle, which is usually random. Uh, also seems easy that the same can be done for single particles as shown here. It's a nice picture from Matthew Beck's article. Uh, but it has some issues. So it's not really that easy because um, as I will show further, extinction is a complicated interference phenomenon. And then you put a detector here and the intensity of, of this interference will depend on the transverse coordinate. And that's why the whole detector reading will depend on its size. Uh, this has been acknowledged um, in classical textbooks, both Van der Hulst and Born and Hoffman. Uh, so it, it was known that a detector should be fairly large. So this squared uh, radius should be much larger than wavelengths times the distance. And it also must be not perfectly circular. However, discussion in these textbooks is largely qualitatively, so it's kind of not completely satisfactory. Uh, I think uh, one of the first like quantitative analysis of this phenomena was performed by Matthew Berg for uh, circular detect and then uh, Michael Mishinka um, uh, got on this train. So he, he also contributed to analysis. So he proposed a square detector. And here you see the results basically uh, that we will further also analyze in more details. Uh, this picture showed that you have a very large distance to, to detector shown here, and then you increase the detector size. Again, very large distances. And if you have a circular detector, basically your reading does not converge. So the true value you expect for extinction is somewhere here, and you have wild oscillations around. Uh, and for square detector, you do have some convergence, but it's extremely slow. So that kind of precludes accurate measurement of extinction by this uh, simple uh, setup as shown here. Uh, so my goals uh, in this research and in this talk is to extend quantitative analysis to arbitrary shapes, uh, to account for particle movement, which may happen, and discuss required signal to noise ratio for measuring extinction if one want to try it. Uh, so the problem setting is rather trivial. Uh, so we have interference between spherical and plate waves in the far field. Again, a nice picture by Matthew Beck. Uh, and basically, you, you have this. There are some formulas here, but important is that we make reasonable approximations as uh, detailed here, and then we get into this uh, formula. So this delta i is the difference of detector reading between. Well, it's not the whole detector reading, by, but intensity at certain point on the detector, which, uh, uh, which uh, well, is a difference for when the particle is present and not present. And here you see that uh, you have the scattering amplitude, the incident field, and then this term, which become very important. And we define this as eta for conciseness. So if you want a total signal or total difference uh, signal by the detector, we need to integrate it over the detector surface. Uh, we can do it in quite a general setting, considering a star-shaped plane detector is shown here with some function uh, rho of theta. So R, R would be like the largest ra radius and its total area is A. Uh, and well, we can do this integration over rho, then we left only with integral over theta. So if we define it and we will analyze it further, then our uh, reading, uh, well, th there should be no R here, it just depends on 
uh, just the total difference intensity. Uh, so you have this expression. And this one, it corresponds to standard extinction. So if you remember a formula from Bohr and Hoffman, it will, it will just end here, the square bracket. That would be the extinction cross section. But here you have some correction. So uh, on nuisance parameter, you can call it. Uh, so let's analyze uh, this integral. Uh, first, if the radius is relatively small, sh shown here, then f is uh, not small at all. So it's actually close to one, and then this will be very different from the extinction that you uh, that you expect to see. Uh, then, uh, if it's odd of one, again you have some complex behavior irrelevant for the extinction, and we may only hope to get small f or goes to zero in the limit of fairly large detector size shown here. But again, immediate conclusion of this expression that you just see here, that if you have a circle, so rho is just constant, then this integral will trivially give you this. And that means that the answer will oscillate with uh, detector uh, area. It will be order of one. So then you will get this oscillation as you saw in numerical example before. Uh, and further to evaluate this f, we can actually consider the stationary phase method. Uh, well, for a particle like shown here, so it's kind of a smooth uh, function with some number of extrema. And then contribution from each of these extrema in the stationary phase method will be given by this formula. Well, it's kind of more or less uh, exact, but not very convenient for use. Uh, well, first I know that you can also have a, a contribution from discontinuous of derivatives. For example, if you take a sphere, uh, not a sphere, a square, then you will have these sharp corners, but th those contributions are smaller. So they're order of one over eta, and these are order one over square root of eta. So we can neglect this. And for further analysis, we uh, introduce this measure of deviation from a circle. So that's basically a difference between maximum rho squared over the uh, particle bound, uh, over the detector boundary and the minimum value. And then you can estimate the total integral, something like that. Uh, so, well, you have this simple expression where this uh, gamma is a measure of deviation and eta is uh, k squared over two z. So then let us see on the implications. Uh, so first we consider some significantly non-circular detector like shown here or a square, for example. Then this gamma will be comparable to R squared. And that means that uh, this uh, correction integral F uh, would be of this order. And that means if you want it to be small, you need this to, to be satisfied. However, this needs to be satisfied quadratically. And what I mean by that is that if you want uh, to have this correction of order 1%, then the difference between left and hand side here should be squared of that. So it should be like 10,000 difference. Uh, then again, you can apply it to, for example, a circular detector, but the particle is displaced here from the center. Uh, here, gamma is smaller, so it's not R squared, but uh, R times this, well, potentially small parameter, Y, and then, well, you have this equation. And actually, for this, you can get analytical expression, but it will give you the same order of magnitude as shown here. And then you can also get similar result for rough detector boundary. So it's more or less a general analysis, uh, but let us also include particle diffusion uh, for a circular detector. Uh, we just consider some diffusion, but the characteristic displacement, which is based by diffusion coefficient and some time of diffusion or time of measurement, uh, we assume that it's smaller than radius of the detector. And then, well, you can do some math and obtain the following expression. And if you want, again, this to be small, so this averaged value of f unit C, which is defined here, uh, to be much larger than one. And that means that this value should be much, also much larger than one, but as a square root. So it's by contrast to the previous case here to have this like 1%, uh, it's sufficiently to have this number of order 10 or something. So not, not that large. Uh, looking at this, you may want to increase the diffusion so that the particle will spread over the larger 
part of the detector area or even go outside, but that's a bad idea because, well, if you consider it egoistly, then the main extinction term will differ. So you want the extinction term as shown before to stay the same. That's more or less the stationary point in two dimension that, that you have, but uh, then uh, only the uh, this correction F to decrease. So you can't really make uh, Y not too large here. And this brings us to like some practical implications. So suppose you want to measure your extinction with 1% accuracy. So the main problem here that first you need what I call a good theoretical accuracy. Uh, what that means that uh, you do a, a specified measurement of with a single detector, like with particle and without particle, and you want to dif the difference to actually correspond to extinction. And that means that all the previous, uh, well, these uh, kind of expressions uh, should be satisfied, because otherwise the difference will just have a different theoretical expression. And this theoretical accuracy implies that you need to have large uh, detector size and also distance to the detector, as we show, as, as you saw also in numerical examples before. But that necessarily means that you will have small relative signals. So basically, your that your total intensity is proportional to detector area, and your well additional signal or decrease of signal that you measure is proportional to extinction cross section, which is more or less particle uh, order of particle cross section at, at least if the particle is not smaller than not much smaller than the wavelengths uh, and then well you can actually do some estimates so for example you have a non-circular detector and a fixed particle and you see there are two expressions here uh, so this is for the theoretical accuracy and this one involves uh, that the condition that angular size of your detector should be at least 10 times smaller than the first diffraction law. Otherwise, you would see not only forward scattering amplitude, but it will be significantly correct. And the problem is that here you have R and Z in one direction and here in opposite, and they can kind of contradict each other. Well, not completely contradict, uh, but if you multiply these two, you get this equation. So basically, the radius of detector should be 100,000 times more than the uh, particle size. And that gives you huge difference in area. And that means that if you want then to measure this extinction cross-section within 1%, then single to noise ratio should be, well, larger than 12 orders of magnitude. So that's huge. If you have a diffusing particle with a displacement, typical displacement of uh, around uh, one-tenth, then, well, it's a bit better. And, that's well, time, you yeah. see 1% one, 1 yes. Uh, one percent is almost impossible. So then you go to like ten percent, and you have one million and ten thousand signal to noise ratio. So that uh, can be doable. And so with that, I conclude. So what I wanted to show is that uh, measuring extinction of single particles with a single detector is very hard. Uh, random particle movement helps, but not as much as for collection of. Of particles and possible improvements. I mean, I'm not a specialist in that, it's just some wild thoughts, but some of them I think were already discussed at this conference, uh, like using multiple detectors, uh, particle flying through detector area instead of random walk, or probably some beam shaping can help. But all of this require careful analysis similar to what uh, I, I have done here. And uh, to finish, so I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, Michael Mishenko, because he was uh, like one of the first who started this quantitative uh, analysis of uh, this issue. And also uh, we discussed uh, some preliminary results with him and he motivated me to actually finish this research, was always uh, encouraging in this respect. Uh, unfortunately, I could not show the final results um, to, to him. And well, frankly speaking, it's not completely finished yet, but still, uh, here it is, and I thank the Russian Science Foundation for funding. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, this was a very nice way of remembering Michael.